Muy buen día para... Hello, everyone. Good day. We welcome you to this panel on public programs, training and education for the employment of people with disabilities. Thanks to Zero Project and also the Descubreme Foundation, its ally in Latin America, for inviting us to participate in this valuable initiative. My name is Alicia Diaz. I'm a specialist in matters of social dialogue, dignified jobs, and labor inclusion for people with disabilities. I am the director and I work for the office for of the ILO for the Southern Corner in Lat Cone in Latin America. We wanted to tell you that since December 2018, the National Service Disabilities of Chile and Senadis has signed an agreement to increase awareness in the public context and in the business context so that people with disabilities can access employment and how they contribute to social and business success. And all of this through the exchange of knowledge, capacity building, network building, and promotion towards inclusion. So in this line, the contribution that we may see from Zero Project and from our valuable value speakers today contribute and we've created the program Mass Inclusion, which has allowed us to design a governance system which is based on the ILO specialty social dialogue where workers, employers, governments, social organizations and civil society organizations develop projects that generate competences towards inclusion. These competences are the ones that we're going to delve into today. This mass inclusion project has a national scope and we've actually received collaboration from many of the speakers here today because we hope to generate competences for inclusion in municipalities, in public institutions, and despite their heterogeneity and the commitment, they don't have the sufficient capacity to serve the entire population. So we need to increase its capacity. So this program, which addresses public programs in favor of inclusion is a panel that makes us very happy because we've found that there's a seed, there's a mobilization of society towards inclusion. This program, this mass inclusion program that makes us feel very proud in the ILO is designed to have lines of action to enable parts of the private sector, the public sector and the civil society, and particularly those who operate and work in the other regions of Chile, creating competences and tools so that in the mid and long term, we can effectively notice the changes. An important quality of the work that we created, the ILO or the skill creation of the dialogue promoters so that the stakeholders can have a political incidence to improve the life conditions and employability of people with disabilities. Today, we are in a very key scenario because there was a set of decisions to be made for the civil society. We have new political actors, uh, regional governors, and the members of the constituents or the creation creators of the new constitutions and we want to fully include people with disabilities and to have an effect on that is that our program supports the creation of capacities for impact and what have we found in on this path we found that there's a huge availability and willingness of the in the institutions to make an impact and true progress but we want some other news as well and in this framework of this development program that you are also sharing 
we developed at least 16 regional dialogue instances for the economic reactivation, the inclusive economic reactivation, setting up conversations between members of the civil society and the public sector, because for the Chilean case, which is no different from Latin America, the data revealed by the National Service are invite us to review the design of the policies and promote access to employment and close the digital gaps that prevent access to employment, which will emerge, have emerged during the pandemic and that will continue after it. The ILO has been identifying that we need to facilitate and reinforce our efforts because the access to social services from people with disabilities and the focus on rights must be overcome so that no people fall into poverty and no one is left behind. To do that, to for to have a focus on people with disabilities, it needs to be uh, equal, uh, equal conditions in terms of inclusion and economic reactivation. We cannot promote employability and economic reactivation without the active participation of people with disabilities, because just as all of the reports of the region have pointed out, the most affected workers those who have the least social coverage, social protection coverage, are those who are falling into poverty because of their impact on their families, people with disabilities and their families. We are attending to this invitation that Zero Project has made to us uh, to discuss this and how to make sure that people with disabilities can keep their jobs, think we can increase labor inclusion and prevent at all costs that they fall in the depths or of poverty. So I'm very glad to invite you to this panel so that having as a context these very powerful impact that the pandemic has had in this region and throughout the world. We can face a society that are listening today and everyone who are interested in promoting inclusion. We're going to be working strongly and very committedly to include decent jobs for people with disabilities, where the role of the public uh, is also key in this inclusion. In this framework, then, we invite to our, our panel members to participate. I'm going to introduce the first one. She's Rosa Maria Quiroz. Rosa Maria is the coordinator of the inclusive modality of the Empleate program with the Ministry of Labor and Social Security, Costa Rica. Rosa Maria has 33 years of service of experience in the public sector and 23 years of experience working directly with the population with disabilities uh, under the Ministry of Labor and Social Security of Costa Rica. She is, has a bachelor's degree in education and a master's in neuroscience and she's participated in the creation of the public policies in Costa Rica, such as the National Plan of Labor Inclusion for People with Disabilities in 2007. Her work is inspirational for all of us working in inclusion. So be very welcome. Good afternoon, and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. To me, it's a real pleasure and honor to be with you sharing this around this topic and the Empleate program in the inclusive modality here in San Jose, Costa Rica. For us, it's, it's an honor as a ministry, a social ministry to present this that's been developed since 2013 up to date. The goal of this inclusive modality is precisely to open the training, technical training spaces and afterwards uh, successful labor inclusion for people with disabilities. All of the people who come to our services in the virtual manner in this 
times now because of the pandemic and in the past in person this is involves a public private strategy which is coordinated from the need of the employer in relation to all of the job positions that at the moment are vacant we sit down with the employer to look for options according to their requirements and then we create a position profile or and then we match that with the person with the disability once that step has been completed we sit down again with the technical team and assess what is exactly what we need to respond to the employer so that they can afterwards hire that person with a disability that is the resource of employer the program program that goes step by step reviewing those requirements and the competences and skills that people with disabilities have or can develop empleate is as i said a project an activity a strategic activity within the national plan of the social ministry it's a highly successful program the social development ministry and it's been successful in countries such as guatemala and el salvador in which the implementation succeeded and it's still working in guatemala in el salvador we are uncertain about what happened in the end but in guatemala we already see that the emplea de inclusion exists another characteristic of this modality is that once these people are selected they receive economic support a subsidy some call it a scholarship but we are not the ministry of public education which is where scholarships are granted we provide subsidies for training that will allow this young this youth to commute from their houses to the training center in this fashion we make sure that they are part of the training and they don't have that excuse which sometimes they say they have that they don't have a way of commuting or moving from one point to the other so we help them with this economic subsidy and as they are in this training program we are conducting alliances with the private so as to find that position once they finish their technical training to provide you with some more context i can tell you that last year despite all of the health global circumstances affecting us with this pandemic we managed to achieve a an inclusion of people with disabilities in labor from 18 to 40 year old people and this in total were over 270 people this people were trained under the requirements of the employers and once the training finished they were included in their work positions they were hired where we have also received different applications from privates to maybe create other alliances other partnerships where they can be certified training centers in san jose de costa rica by the INA, the National Learning Center, and the Emplea de Programs help. This is an alliance. This is a win win situation, undoubtedly, because they managed to find that labor that they work for, that they are paying for, and the people with disabilities, our main interested party, uh, can be socially included and can have a dignified job position, having access to all of the related rights that just any other worker in this country. 
and of course with high expectations of succeeding of, and of course proving that they are capable and they only want labor inclusion an opportunity in the workplace Muchas gracias, Rosa, por tu... thank you so much rosa for your presentation and now continuing with our program we would like to introduce felipe candia who is the national officer of the line for people with disabilities of the national service of training and employment of chile known as sense Felipe is a psychologist with a master's in management and labor inclusion of people with disabilities with also gender studies and studies and public politics policies and the national as a national officer of this program he seeks to guarantee the equal access and opportunities countrywide for people with disabilities through a specialized model. The floor is all yours. Alicia, muchas gracias por tu presentación. Alicia, thank you so much for your introduction. I'm glad to share this instance with you and the rest of the panel, this very high level panel, always looking at Costa Rica and your experience in labor inclusion. I'd like to tell you that I'm, my name is Felipe Candia, as Alicia introduced me. I'm the National Officer of the Line for People with Disabilities, with SENSE, the National Service of Training and employment part of the ministry of work and social prevention provisions implementing uh, actions and training programs with a focus on people's employability and also in companies productivity particularly where it's most needed which is in the vulnerable sectors and among workers in this context uh, this line for people with disabilities is created in the program formate para el trabajo seeking to create equal conditions and equal access uh, for dependent labor for people with disabilities and in the essence of this project is uh, becoming a tool that which allow people with disabilities to access the labor market by acquiring the technical skills uh, in a trade beyond soft skills and respecting the rights of people with disabilities we try to ensure ensure this in the process accompanying with specialist in labor inclusion so that they can have the necessary adjustments in the training program and also following them up in their once they obtain a job with support from the team along with specialized interventions of professionals we're constantly working with our executing entities and unities for inclusion reinforcing the universal design for learning and something that today is absolutely necessary which is web accessibility both at the level of platforms and contents also in recent years we've added incorporated psychoeducational work with the families of our participants which is necessary because in previous years we noted much resistance to the component of labor inclusion and regarding innovation in this program well it, it lies in the special in its specialized model with a focus on the training process and in the process of accessing to job positions in this pandemic we add the training to the remote modality which allowed us to hold online courses and having more web accessibility independent of their disability and we've had other innovations in the work with the families because not only technology is our ally but the ecosystem of our users must also be taken care of regarding the impact of the program in the lives of our participants when we did follow-ups prior to the pandemic we had data which said that prior entering the program only 9.2 percent of our participants presented at least one uh, quotation in the security system and that program made this triple uh, reaching almost 30 percent there was an independent follow-up that accounted for 56 of our participants belonging to the workforce after 12 months of entering the program and regarding that segment they realized that 69 percent the this positions 
are still occupied involving now increasing after 18 months to seven over 70 percent we also highlight the support to economy and also we emphasize on the presence of social inclusion because it provides useful tools for the daily lives after the pandemic so far we had 643 participants 452 of them already participating in our online courses where we can find people with all kinds of disabilities with 50 percent presence of women and we've had even higher percentages, 75% of women and over 60% were unemployed when they entered our program. Now, regarding the success factors, in the case of a public initiative of this dimension, this size, it goes hand in hand with the working with joint work. We've tried to aim to universal standards and rights, but also validating our interventions and, and we've worked with the committee uh, of social inclusion of SOFOFA, committees of productivity who have been great allies, both COSAM and also foundations and national offices of disabilities. And currently with all of the difficulties having online courses for people with disabilities, we've found small communities that have gathered through our courses, through WhatsApp and using their social media. So the program in this sense has meant creating community, building a community. Now regarding financing and sustainability of the program, this program has been a part of the two administration's agendas. So this shows that when these initiatives have a humane and social background, they will be sustained. Now we have 3,600 positions, uh, which has meant a in investment higher than 7 million pesos, 7 billion pesos and 10, billion, $10 million dollars in investment. And now the challenge is in the hiring of our employees and our building of networks in today's world is focused in that direction. We seek to have existentialist views and change the mindset that people have about people with disabilities and we try to aim to sectors with high turnover to provide higher um, economic growth for our country and we also try to be involved uh, another competitor in the formal world uh, without competing in the process we want to have a gender perspective also responding to the numbers from recruitment data by the law 20,015 where out of 10 hires only one is a woman three hires one is a woman so we've thought about jobs for the future with social media administration and courses on data management in the metropolitan region and also in via via region south of the country now we are saying that we also want to break the close the gaps of in traditional jobs for people with disability attracting to sense these talents and trying to foster people with disabilities in this area i think this is a challenge that will continue to grow and as a public policy we attempt to open the doors also to social inclusion um, to the digital transformation thank you so much thank you so much felipe for your presentation we will meet again in the panel to delve deeper into the very interesting topics that you present now I have the thrill of presenting Cristian Silva Valdebenito, another speaker. He has a master's in psychology. He has many degrees in topics like mental health, community mental health, human rights, social inclusion, health management, psychosocial re rehabilitation, psychosocial interventions in vulnerability spaces, among others. With all this community work that he's done, he's recently been chosen as a member of the Council of the Civil Society Senadis, currently in the metropolitan region. So congratulations, Christian, on this very important role. So we will meet on a regular basis 
knowing your contribution on these very valuable topics. So currently, Christian is also director of the Day Hospital and Protected Home for Dual Pathologies Alcino in the commune La Florida in Santiago, Chile. Welcome. Thank you for being with us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for that introduction, Alicia. Clearly, in the space of the Regional Council of COSOP, and I'm also member of the Council of Integration for people with mental health problems, we are trying to encourage them to participate in civil society. As you said, I am also director of a day hospital and I belong to a model that I believe we should start changing, which is the paradigm of the biomedical model. We've created these networks and within that space and that workspace we've created and we have built a group of professionals on this day hospital and a group of people rehabilitated from these different mental issues that we created this cooperative that's called resistire i will resist clearly if i if i take the who as a guideline that's not enough for me because we need social inclusion. To have social inclusion in Chile, this has been a very difficult task to work with people with mental disorders because we have to work with stigma and the difficulties that the very professionals have because they, they work in a context of medicine and not social determinants. And we've managed to constitute this because we've worked almost 20 years where we have rehabilitated many people in psycho and social aspects with people that usually were homeless and they weren't considered in different spaces. They were, they belong to different institutions that still exist in our country, like mental hospitals that I think should be eliminated to have a model of mental health that we can actually do what we are doing now. That these, have, these are not new because if you take Argentina as a guideline, social companies that they've been working since 1986, or other places in Latin America, we are really behind. So to create this safe, protected space where we can accompany them and we can be productive, we chose this concept of cooperative. And this has to do with principles that have to do with international cooperativism with different levels of autonomy, with commitment, with independence, with permanent training and education for these spaces. And cooperative values have to do with this, solidarity, equity, democracy, and responsibility. So in that way, when you talk about cooperatives, the base is social and solidarity economy that is very linked to these cooperatives and have to do with solidarity associated to a commonwealth and equity. So what are these features? For example, productive force, which is a new way of having a company. This is distributed in a different way and the interchange relationships are fair where we have cooperation, reciprocity, and a lot of associations. It's such a beautiful world that ultimately you said, how didn't we think about this before? How haven't we found a place where there's no discrimination, where ultimately we think about a comprehensive development of mankind in society? And we see other things like sustainability, the taking care of the environment. So we that we work in a day hospital that we have 
patients. We don't want any more patients. We want people that can lead. We want people that can be productive and cooperative citizens. And just now in Chile, we had this very important social outburst, social uprising on 2019. And we started realizing that a lot of times the problems were not associated to biological problems, but also to social determinants. Alicia was saying that we should make dignity a habit. So how we we realized that people are subjects of rights, not of charity. And at least us, we realized many years ago, and we've always worked with a different job and work organizations from the government. Like Felipe said before, Senadi, which is a national service for disability and different funds and relief funds, but we have never been able to enter the competitive world. And to do this, you have to be profitable. And the only thing that made sense for us was the, this cooperative. And for example, if we take Freud as an example, at some point our journalists asked him, what was for him a healthy person and maybe this journalist was expecting a very huge speech about sexuality and different aspects freud said my friend anyone that's capable of loving and working can be capable of participating in a society so what spaces we've created here the red ones are the ones that are ready knowing others generating bonds of trust knowing the business, defining roles, different services, gardening services, and different personal entrepreneurships. You have to be informed and participate in create, create a work plan. You have to discuss the different statutes. There's a lot of information that you need to handle. So this different entities, tell you that this is well constituted, this is well created. So there's a lot of administrative work that you have to do. And I believe that for that reason, many cooperatives are not integrated by people with different disabilities. So you have to go to the public market and start billing and start creating profits. We used to offer coffee break services. So after the pandemic, we didn't have any opportunities to work. We've done small things, but not in the size that we had thought before, for example, in municipalities and different ministries. Our cooperative of work services, the one that we represent, our principles are very clear. Open and volunteer participation, we're always evaluating different members. We evaluate this in our own groups. As, as I said before, we have five professionals, five users or former users, but there are also five organizations for of civil society. This capital is analyzed, all the members are analyzed, we are doing this. And of course, we have to be a part of other inclusive cooperatives and the ones that we have are for people that have physical and side impairment impairments but not for psychosocial impairments there's a federation of cooperatives in chile you have to participate in this for us to work as a cooperative administratively was because of another cooperative that's called Cooperativa Jurídica, and this is connected with a community that offers different services, especially for our services. I'm going to leave a cartoon of a very amazing woman. The man says, good morning, girl. Can I speak to the head of the household? And the girl answers, 
there is no head of the household here. We are a cooperative. So now to finish my presentation, I would like to leave you with a video that states some of the entrepreneurships that our former members have done. So thank you very much for your attention. It has been proven that a large part of the population of the world has their health affected due to poor food consumption and to eating too many processed foods that are high in antibiotics and hormones that affect our internal microbiota, which fulfills key functions in our organism, especially for our immune system. Understanding the importance of this, we have studied the passioning world of the foods that are key to balance out this internal microbiota. This is how Como Vivo was created, aiming at an audience that needs to eat healthy, organic, and sustainable foods. My name is Paulina Kalvitz, and I am the creator of this company. I am passionate for cooking, and together with my daughter Eileen, who is a medical student, we have created Conbucha Mor, a 100% fermented organic beverage which has a flavor and natural uh, sparkle. We also offer free healthcare advice. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Saez, and I am part of the group Resistere and I am part of Hogar Protegido. And at this moment, my trade is to create wood plant holders. And if you want anything, my phone number is on the screen. Reach out, I am a carpenter. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Dominguez. I am also part of the cooperative Resistere, and I am in charge of gardening. Everything that has to do with gardening is my responsibility. If you need my services, feel free to reach out. My phone number is on the screen at the moment. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is René Teyeri, and I am the coordinator of the group of construction of the cooperative Alcino. At the moment, we are working on placing tents for our foster home, which is Protegido. So if you happen to need anything, we can do any type of work for you. We can do welding, woodwork, framing, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of repairs that you may need at home. Thank you, Christian, so much for your presentation and for giving us the opportunity of getting to know about the co cooperatives and the opportunities generated by this, presenting a way of working that's cooperative, which is a sign of how the world of work is going to be organized. We will go back to that point in a few moments. Now, I have the chance to present to you Magda Hernández, Magda is a social worker and is part of the national team for attention for vulnerable people of the National Service of Learning from Colombia, the SENA. Magda, good afternoon, good day to you, and thank you for being with us today in this presentation. The floor is yours. Gracias, Alicia. Hola para todos. Mucho gusto. Thank you, Alicia. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to Zero Project. Es un gusto, un placer para mí compartir este espacio de la experiencia. It's a pleasure for me to share with you the space sobre empleo. Así que about employment. Presentar un contexto acerca de lo que es el Servicio Nacional de Asistencia. I would like to present this service. This is a state entity that provides work training that's also technological and complementary to contribute to the social level of the workers in different regions. We are very related to employment and entrepreneurship. We have different approaches 
y otro componente one is work con la intermediation de and the other one is la agencia pública management de empleo, el SENA es un miembro de la red de operadores del servicio público de empleo we are a member of a network of public service and employment we are intermediates between people and companies that require human talent so we accompany people on their job search to participate in the different offers and we have on a national level 33 employment offices that provide counsel and advices for people that want to be a part of the workforce. There's a job intermediate application. They can present their job offers. The users can register. They can review the different positions and the training provided by the councils provide help for using this platform. This training addresses soft skills, strengthens skills regarding training for interviews, for example, and this provides better and more effective opportunities for a job with inclusion and accompaniment and also with a contribution of for the business world that requires human capital the idea is to be a companion the idea is to advise the businessmen on their inclusion process as we move towards that purpose another effect associated to this two fields of action to do with the entrepreneurship route. We support entrepreneurs that have a talent and they want through this initiative, they look for strengthening their companies through different entrepreneurships. And, and they get to do this with this association. We also certify and evaluate our competences. So we are support the user of this population, work on their work competences that they've acquired throughout the years. Now, Regarding our big task, it has to do with inclusion in the workforce. We formulate and we started adopting an institutional policy for disability. This is to promote the inclusion culture and to appropriate these practices in the business world. So its objective is to generate inclusion, access and permanence of people with disabilities in all services that they can work in. This disability policy was achieved and it manages to address different initiatives, training, and other alternatives. They promote adjustment and adaptation processes facing the different procedures that this entity promotes. This policy and its contributions to inclusion practices. So from this policy, we want to comment that this is a pioneer in these kinds of policies. And through these policies, we've managed to provide many tools for our users. We qualified the competences for the different administrative staff and also training for caretakers so they can find in this 
an opportunity to strengthen those competences and to be able to generate an income opportunity because having this role generates a long-term commitment. Another aspect in the inclusion practices is that we strengthen the interest on the business sector of providing trainings through SENA for users and for people with different disabilities. This has allowed us to mobilize and define different programs and specialities and also have an impact on the design of different programs that have a duration of six months to a year. We managed to do some longer trainings, some of them up to two years. So all participants get all the competences. We have platforms, we have tutorial videos of sign language, and we've progressed to the access of this to all people. This policy and its contributions have also generated a recognition or a very powerful work that's articulated with different organizations, with different business people to prepare people for inclusion or people with different abilities. We have a national goal that requires us to promote actions, affirmative actions for inclusion. And that's a special recognition into the collaborations for this goal. So this team of counselors mobilize this purpose. In this entity, there's also a special budget that has increased for hiring interpreters for sign language. They've also increased sponsorship for our learners, for our students. And they have the opportunity to develop their productive stage in this kind of modality that links our applicants with disabilities in this learning modality. We pro made progress in infrastructure, favoring accessibility in different levels. There's a very important contribution that have to do with a large number of libraries creating meaningful experiences for audiobooks and clear language for accessibility, for example, for people with intellectual disabilities also. We've also strengthened the development of actions together with other organizations to create platforms and to create mechanisms to support the business world and in this process of linking. What are the impacts and what have been the challenges? Well, this entity has hired people with disabilities as trainers. Some of them are contractors in the different modalities in the field. We've also linked students that start their productive stage in SENA. And afterwards, we've had the chance of making an inclusion process. And today, they are linked to this entity. Another relevant aspect is the opportunity of generating exclusive callings for entrepreneurs with technical advisors, with follow-ups, they are accompanied and they provide this capital, this seed capital through a fund, through SENA. And on average, we assign around $21,000 that are around 80 million Colombian pesos. 
Yes, yeah. We've also had impacts in the business sector because we've mobilized the accompaniment of the entity to strengthen this model with politics of inclusion. The SENA has been a constant reference for support to the sector. We've had incidents and impact to create opportunities for our former participants and we've accompanied them in the job inclusion. Another aspect has been that we provide a benefit of accessibility with a model of preference percentage. So by group or by specialty, there's a percentage exclusive for our applicants with disabilities. We also do follow-ups for, for them we analyze their income and these populations have different kinds of communications because we have different participation processes. And to finalize, I would like to share the efforts that we want that strengthen accessibility criteria of the platforms in the different entities. Our platforms are very robust. They demand effort to usability and we have academic platforms administrative platforms platforms through which business men can contact our applicants with different sponsorships and different platforms that we are mobilizing and we are adjusting which is the public job generator so we are also working with that currently, strengthening the latter, especially for the business sector so that they can promote their inclusion policies and they can provide an opportunity for our former participants that they can actually participate in the job work. In terms of methodological and pedagogical during the pandemic has been a very challenging experience but has been a very positive balance because we can guarantee higher participation and higher inclusion in the population and this has allowed us to connect regions and different experts of other places that are very far away so we can increase participation of our activists in this pandemic situation. Without it, we wouldn't have managed this connection. And it is a challenge that we need to strengthen because it has promoted the participation in a very important way. Accelerate processes of methodological aspects of the virtual platforms in distance. We have complementary programs in technology, and these are virtual, so that's also a big challenge. That these objectives have those dimensions that they can be adaptable, and so that this platform can start complying with accessibility aspects. And one last challenge that I would like to highlight is that we need to create a team that's leader in accessibility. In a regional level and on different levels, we have teams that promote, provide guidance and explain because this is an accompanying process because it's an also a constant learning. So this was my presentation announcing these challenges that we have and that collaboratively we've faced. Thank you so much, Alicia. Well, thank you. Thank you for your presentations. We are now in the Q&A session with Felipe, Christian, Magda, and Rosa Maria, where we'll present some joint reflections on the challenges and the time that we're living in, 
in terms of employment, employability, and training, education. I just wanted you to reflect overall uh, more before we go into the details. What are the changes that you've observed in this period which have intensified, escalated in this period in the employment world? What have you observed and what have you seen for the people with disabilities in terms of social inclusion? So I would start with a general idea from ILO. We have our own perspective that it was very in-depth and what we call the future of labor, but it instead it became the present of labor where we saw a vast amount of job positions that disappeared or will disappear and that won't come back. Those jobs will not be executed, will not be performed in the way they used to. But we have observed this for all of the regions that we have the growing rates of informal labor and where the social sphere is unprotected. They have no social protection and that has grown. Uh, Magda and Felipe both presented these ideas. Any training involves a way out in labor, aiming to dignified work with social protection and growing labor. And I would say that in you mentioned before that you explore the diversification of jobs for people with disabilities. So what are your preliminary results, Felipe? And what conditions do you see emerging from public policies? As you know, whoever participates in this panel and for those of you who are watching, Sense is the great service that promotes employment in Chile, promoting labor inclusion, but also uh, range, a very large range of job positions. So they have seen their internal changes. Thank you so much for your question, Alicia. In your presentation of the question, you already uh, hit some notes on a reality that exists today. Increasing informality has forced many people with disabilities today to leave their jobs due to the pandemic, due to the the transportation of the commuting times or so many job positions have been closed and that has had a strong impact. And so the last year we had several surveys showing employment specifically for people with disabilities that we show that we looked at in a very cautious way to determine our next steps. So in that direction we see an opening of a new window through which we want to enter with services, with remote, with teleworking. And despite this pandemic has taken many sources of labor today, has given a reason for many people with disabilities requesting teleworking and requesting the possibilities to work from home today uh, to have them because it's a way of working that has been disseminated widespread particularly for for white collar jobs professional like jobs and for people with disabilities that source of employment was uh, not extends uh, and we want to open the spaces for in-person jobs and remote jobs accompanying and our, our users, but the, the challenge has been tough because as I mentioned in my presentation today, many job positions have been lost and you, we need to go out and search for companies against uh, as if we had started with zero with the law of inclusion. And now we need to sort of evangelize again. We've seen many companies who thought that with the pandemic and with this uh, low rates, uh, the inclusion law is suspended, but we need to reinforce the fact that it's not suspended and we need to continue working towards the rights of people with disabilities. And what Christian mentioned is important, something that it's coming for the future is associative work and cooperative work. Effectively, this is something that in Chile we haven't done much prog made much progress in and there's very little experience with cooperative organizations and it's important for us to support that social need that is being coordinated uh, 
towards social inclusion, self-managed inclusion. We have no clear tools to do that, but we are looking at it and we're interested to support the cooperative entities that are working to, for people with disabilities. Thank you so much, Felipe. A very interesting point, what you mentioned, because when we see that from the public role with the a more systemic vision, a system which is integrating many opportunities, different programs, which understand and address the complexity of the challenge. Right? We think that's relevant because uh, Christian, met, Christian stated it as um, creating a project and building a cooperative uh, institution involves different entities that are not necessarily linked to service uh, or linked to important initiatives. But uh, you presented some topics as well as Magda, a very uh, right in the heart of the initiatives that we're working with, which is accompaniment or follow up in our experience with the Mass Inclusion Program and all of the other programs for inclusion that we've observed globally and also Zero Project undoubtedly is the core or the, the cornerstone for social and labor inclusion and it's the it's embedded in the in the equation and the strategies for training, we need to make adjustment, we need to adjust the curricula, we need to adjust the pedagogy. It was even mentioned that there are groups of people conducting this type of accompaniment with, with about which there's not necessarily so much experience. So a very well designed policy, but there's a there's this gap for the people accompanying disabled people in the process. So we are slowly making progress, but we're putting it right in the center of this conversation, as you told us, uh, we've advanced in the cooperation model, in the work model as, as the labor access. So what do you believe today are the opportunities today in the current scenario about the chances of developing this model to a greater scale than resistide cooperation is cooperative organization? What would you say um, in terms of policies for those of us creating labor intermediation or developing competences what would be those challenges and what would be the skills the competences we need in order to promote this model to a larger scale and i take this opportunity to ask another question do we believe in ILO, ILO of course as in other places that the challenge of climate change and the sustainability challenges that you stated that you posed are also uh, involve well, we have circular economy, orange economy. What do you think about that? Thank you so much for your question because despite Felipe is here representing a national institution and from what I saw, the other colleagues and partners from other countries are also representing the nation uh, wide programs. Sometimes it's only the good intentions are left only on paper in terms of public policies, but not because I believe, because, well, this is my personal view, but not because I believe they're non existent. In Chile, for instance, the policies on mental health since the 90s, this is associated to community social health, but it's everything, everything's only on paper, not. Not even because there's no implementation, but because we like the professionals, the people, the, the courses, the undergraduate degrees, the graduate degrees in the community aspect and human rights aspect and sustainability, social uh, aspects. There's no training, there's no education about this. So to the extent that the professionals maintain link to the paradigms associated to the processes linked to the patriarchy, to the hegemonization of the biomedical model, this won't change. This will continue 
the same. And as I said, we have not invented absolutely anything. We've only taken the same that the national plan for mental health says. And if I ask, I ask the rest of the colleagues and people that will be attending this event uh, to see the visions that they have of the Ministry of Health, Economy, Ministry of Development, the Ministry of Sports, the Ministry of Inclusion, as Uruguay has. Let's see their perspective, Let's see the vision that they state, inclusion, protection, uh, rights, promotion, recovery. Those are the words repeated in all of their visions, but we need to account for that we need to be responsible for that. We have been responsible with people with severe psychiatric disorders. My colleagues are my former patients today. So when you are putting at stake everything that involves being subject to a right and in a real and efficient way, in the sense that there's reciprocity and solidarity and horizontality in the treatment, in the earnings or in the case of a cooperative organization in thinking from the same perspective regarding the environment the economic matters the protected and the productive uh, clearly this all needs to change i'm sorry i'm going to interrupt you christian i would just like to tell you that i just wanted to say that since I represent the Resistere Cooperative Organization, cannot continue just being a good practice or a model of good practices. I believe that good practices cannot continue being good practices. They need to become public policies. I don't know. Okay, so advanced in that. As I told you, I don't know. So advancing at a greater scale, uh, scaling up is what you're presenting. That is one of the huge challenges, changing the paradigm, changing perspective, and that's what you've all said, everyone providing the services. It's part of what Sensa does and a relevant part of what Magda does from Sena. So I wanted to ask, the, ask Magda now from Sena, taking the few minutes that we have left to also tell us in this experience, because Sena has a very powerful system a very sensible one for the region in terms of training, competences, and others. So in this reflection that we're asking you to make about the change of paradigm and the way of training, what do you think in this next two minutes? Um, that What do you think are the greatest challenges for SENA that we should address from labor inclusion? Yes, Alicia, I fully agree. We need a change in paradigm, but the challenge is to serve the requirements of the company sector, the industry in times of the pandemic, and we are now teleworking, and this is uh, shaping the ways of developing their production and mobilizing more job positions and the changing paradigm would be focused on the SENA creating programs responding to the needs of the sector. What are those opportunities to quantify and qualify the profiles of the population? How do we as a labor observatory analyze the behavior of the sector and define then uh, and according to the vocation of the territories, what are the opportunities of uh, the training that the company world needs, the business world needs. So we're focused on three main components. One of those is training, defining the new curricular designs that are challenging when creating the policies for home, working at home, for teleworking and around the behavior of the labor observatory and analyzing what are the trainings, the, what is the education that is, that's not have a 
a field of work anymore. And now how can we foster with a gender perspective those occupations, those prof um, degrees that have been uh, gender biased and now understand that women can feel fulfill this uh, positions as well. It's about appropriating of technology tools and what is integrated in this change of actions towards teleworking and working from home. Thank you, Magda, for closing so wonderfully this section of questions. Now, along with reflecting, we are going to invite Rosa Maria so that she can give us a few words on how she's observing this change in the workplace. Well, I think that the current trends in employment for people with disabilities are very much related to the changes that we've all gone through. They are not separate. They are not exempt from these changes, having to leave those obstacles moving from the in-person to the virtual settings and using technology, technologies of information and communication, ICTs. And this is precisely where we find that challenge, right? There are barriers that are more in the side of companies and there are barriers that are on the side of people with disabilities. I would say that challenges for the private companies at the time are related with the lack of occupational roles, which respond to the demand of requirements of those job positions. And in the second place, we have a challenge not to change mindset, but to develop among employers a more broader vision and um, more in solidarity, a vision that is more empathetic when adapting a job position for a person with a disability. Doesn't matter what disability. And why am I saying this? Because it's because employers sometimes think that it's a huge challenge to hire someone with a disability because they think that they must invest in their companies or their workplace. And that is not necessarily the case. There are many simple actions that can be taken. For instance, in 2019, we had the experience with a group of deaf people who entered a company as uh, industrial operators and the employer calls me in desperation the next day because he didn't know how to communicate with with deaf people and he was concerned that at lunchtime or whenever they went to eat they had their break that he didn't know how to tell them to go to the cafeteria so what we did was to just place a light bulb at their workplaces. And once that was turned on, uh, it, it, it was turned on whenever they needed to go to lunch. And then at the cafeteria, there was also a light bulb for them, which started blinking once when the time was going to run out and it would turn off when it would go out when they needed to go back to work. It was something much of a novelty for the employer, but it was a very simple change. Another challenge that people with disabilities face at the time is showing their potential, leaving the fear aside and taking that opportunity 
so that they have labor options and for example the moment of the interviews they may overcome their fears because that is the time when they are being left behind in some cases and other challenges for people with disabilities are related also to the um, the equity the gender equity to be able to aspire to those leadership positions particularly women with disabilities they can develop in ICTs and finish their secondary education for example and the processes of recruitment we find more challenges for people with disabilities sometimes they have a requirement that it is not developed by many employers that is also a challenge for people with disabilities to be able to improve their records, their technical preparedness, and particularly bearing in mind that in current times, employers, at least in Costa Rica, are not so much focused on academic degrees. They're now emphasizing on what we call soft skills or social emotional skills. Employers are also demanding that as part of the training requirements, there's a horizontal management of this area, this emotional skills. So, so we have asked the training centers that are part of the employee program to implement this manual on social emotional skills or soft skills where the person can develop sort of communication, teamwork, punctuality is also key, the dress code, etc. So we all have challenges unquestionably, both on the employers and the people with disabilities and public institutions. We are all facing challenges on the daily basis. But the good thing is that there's openness, there's support, and of course, credibility that this is a program and an institution which is advocating for the rights on the employer's side and the people with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thanks to the panel members. Thanks Rosa Maria, Felipe, Cristian and Magda. This has been a very valuable instance, a very valuable segment. And of course, we want to keep going in depth, but we'll have the opportunity to go into the details of this topic. But we, of course, shall continue to pay attention and continue fighting for people with disabilities and the, the, in, the inclusion because labor inclusion is a door, but this of course, involves accompaniment and a gender focus and a focus on human rights and a system to support and socially protect them with a community that is serving people with disabilities, but also people with disabilities who are protagonists, who are the main characters in their own story of change. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to Zero Project for inviting us to share our ideas and we'll continue with our commitment towards transformation to have better conditions for people with disabilities. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. It's always good to hear everyone. It's been refreshing. It has been very interesting to listen to everyone. So thank you for participating. Thank you for inviting us.